We are in a series called Loving, and today is the last of our series, and I just want to talk to you about what it means to be loving toward God. Now, imagine somebody walked into our church, stood up on stage, and said these words, I just want all of you to know that I love God so much. What does that mean to you? Do you get excited about what they have to say next? Or do you start to brace for impact for what might follow? What is it that you assume will happen after someone says something like this? After they stand up in a group and say, I want you to know that I love God so much. I will tell you that I have come to expect a morally regressive statement to follow shortly after this one. Usually because there is about to be a step backwards morally that I was not prepared for. And the way they justify it is by their love for God. Now, I may be alone in this experience, or I may not be, but I have to ask you if you've been in that experience, why is it that we've come to expect a morally morally regressive statement after I hear the phrase, I just want you all to know that I love God so much? Well, to understand that, I gotta take you back to the year 1994, which is 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 a few years ago now, and I looked something like this in 1994. Now, if you're wondering what's going on here, I am dressed in a pseudo-military uniform about to bring an American flag into a church. In other words, a lot has changed since 1994. (laughs) Now, I bring this era into our mind right now because I want you to know what it was that I was taught and what I believed very much about who God was and how God wanted me to love God. You have to go back to the fall, which takes place in Genesis chapter 3. I pictured Adam and Eve looking exactly like this back in 1994. And it was here that humanity rejected God and cast all of the world into sin. And as I knew back in 1994, the wages of sin were, of course, death. But God intervened into the eventual plan of demise of all of us by offering us salvation through the cross And as long as we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then one day we could all go to heaven. Now, going to heaven was contingent on you accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior and essentially telling the world, I want you all to know that I love God so much. Now, that may sound simple, but there was a bit of a caveat that came from the Ten Commandments. And back in 1994, when I pictured Moses, I pictured Moses exactly like this, right? And it was here in this commandment, these 10 commandments, that I come across a phrase that a lot of Christians are familiar with, although they're not so familiar with the context around it. During the second commandment, we read these words, you shall not bow down to idols or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me. Now, this was very much in my mind because I would often hear people come and speak at my church and at church school, and they would tell us that we worship a jealous God who does not want you to worship any other idols. Now, as an 11-year-old, I thought to myself, I don't have any idols in my house. (laughs) To which the speaker would then say, there are idols all around us, and it's important that no matter what it is that you encounter, you have to understand that that can become an idol eventually. In other words, they wanted me to say I love God so much, but in a way that meant I love God more than everything else. And I remember a speaker saying, hey, do you guys like Star Wars? And as as an 11-year-old, I was like, yes. As a 39-year-old, I'm still like, yes, I do. (laughs) I love Star Wars. And the speaker would say, but do you love Star Wars more than you love praying? Uh, I don't know how to answer that. A few years later, I heard another pastor say, hey, do you all love reading Harry Potter? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do you love it more than reading the Bible? Mm. (laughs) Ah, This is a trick question, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) And this idea that we have to love God more than everything else was so ingrained in me that even on my wedding day, this theology showed up. Kimmy and I chose to write our own vows back in 2010, And I have these words in my vows to her toward the very end of the vows that I spoke on my wedding day. I wrote these words and said them in front of everyone. I give everything I am to you, Kimmy, and nothing will be more important to me save God himself. 
I wanted to make sure that if God was listening, that God was, knew that God was still number one. And I, for some reason, had to let Kimmy know that even on her wedding day, she was in second place. <laughs> now, why would I say this? Why is it that I would make sure that everyone knew that this was the hierarchy of priority of love in my life? I think it's because even in 2010, I really believed that the foundational characteristic of God was jealousy. That God, more than anything else, was a jealous God, and that God, more than anything else, wanted your devotion before God wanted anything else from you. And this devotion had to be the number one priority. Otherwise, God, I don't know if I'm making it to heaven. And so I think about Star Wars and wedding vows and Harry Potter, and I think about all of these other things. And the minute that you start to believe in a jealous God that demands that you love God more than anything else you encounter, all of a sudden, everything I encounter is immediately uh, in a competition with an insecure God. That's what happens when we start to believe in this jealous God. And so when I hear someone stand up and say, I just want all of you to know that I love God so much, and we hear a morally regressive statement, I believe this can be tied directly to a theology of jealousy. The theology of a jealous God motivates Christians to fight progress, to say, I'm not going to just go with the flow and do what's right here. I'm going to go with what my religion has taught me is morally acceptable because culture is trying to drag that away. And I've got to prove to God that I am more devoted to God than what my culture says should be important. So the theology of a jealous God often motivates Christians to fight progress, which is why I brace for impact when someone says, I love God so much. Now, there's a problem here. I get the sense that other progressive Christians have the same kind of brace for impact that I've experienced as well. And for this reason, progressive Christians have kind of kept the phrase, I love God so much, at arm's length. They've, they've, they haven't really said it. They've often said like things like, you know, I believe in love. I, I don't know what it really means to be- believe that, God, uh, that I love God. I don't really know what it means to confess that in front of people. And so progressive Christians haven't really defined what it means for us to love God. And because of that, we've allowed other Christians to define what it means for a human being to love God. And I think this must change. Yeah. Progressive Christians need to reclaim our professed love for God. We need to be able to say to each other, you know, I do love God, and let me tell you what that's like. Now, I'm going to offer a definition in this sermon, and I want you to know it may be a different definition than you, and that's okay. But this is the definition that helps me understand the most what it means for me to love God. And to get to that definition, I have to tell you about three books of the Bible, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Now, these epistles in the New Testament are written to a community of house churches about the year 100 CE. What happened is these house churches, these Christians were meeting in houses, and all of a sudden there was a massive split. There was a massive fracturing of the community, and the question that 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John seeks to answer is, how do you navigate the fracturing of a community? So these letters, all written by the same author, most likely, all have tips on how it is that we're supposed to navigate a fracturing community. We'll start with the shortest of these letters, 3 John, which is just a handful of verses long. I'm just going to give you a summary. I encourage you to read it on your own. But if I could summarize 3 John for you all, it would basically be a letter that reads, Dear Christians, Gaius, who stayed with our community, is good. Diotrephes, who left our community, is bad. Be like Gaius. Love, John. Second John is a book that if you know my history, this has been a little bit of a rivalry with this book because it got me in big trouble once upon a time. If I could summarize Second John for you in a very short, succinct letter, it would be basically, dear Christians, love one another. Unless you meet someone who believes differently than you, don't love them. Love John. <laughs> That's the main thrust of Second John. First John is much longer than Second and Third John. It has five chapters. And if you could summarize 1 John, I think the best summary would be, dear Christians, the people who stayed are good, the people who left are bad, love John. 
And if you look at all three of these letters and the collective wisdom they offer to someone who's trying to figure out how to navigate a fracturing community, the, avi- the advice they collectively give us is this. Tell everyone that stayed God loves them. Tell everyone that left that they are the Antichrist. And yes, John, or the author of John, uses the word Antichrist repeatedly to describe people who left the community. Now, I tell you all this because I want you to know I am completely uninspired by the theses of this letter. I just can't get excited about it. I mean, basically, this is very much like a kindergarten kind of spirituality. You're with us? Great. God loves you. You're not? You're the Antichrist. However, I have to tell you, I am completely inspired by some of the passages in 1 John. Some of my favorite writings in all of Scripture are in 1 John. And you may ask, how can this be? And I would say, I will tell you, this is the theological equivalent of a blind squirrel finding a nut. (laughs) I think this author stumbled onto something that is so profound that it has been life-changing to me. And 1 John 4, 7 to 12 is one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. And I think the author didn't realize how profound, progressive, bright, intelligent he was being when he wrote it. Today, we're just going to look at one of those verses, 1 John 4, verse 7, because in it packs a giant theological punch. We read, beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And the only response that is worthwhile is this, whoa, are you serious? How come no one proof texted this verse to me? How come no one told me, hey, you want to know God? Just love the next person that's closest to you. Just get out there and love someone, and you'll start to see God's presence. I love the way Peter Rollins writes about it. He's one of my favorite authors. He says, here, God is not approached as an object that we must love, but as a mystery present in the very act of love itself. The best part about this is he's not talking about 1 John. He's talking about the book of Galatians. And this idea that God is not an object to be loved, but instead is a mystery present in the very act of love itself is a very common biblical theme. Some of my favorite stories in the Bible embody this idea that we do not love an object or a being. Instead, we engage in the mystery and the presence of God the moment we begin to love another, love ourselves, or love something about this world. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Man, I wish I knew this verse before my wedding vows to my wife. Because I wouldn't have said, I want you to know, Kimmy, you're in second place today. You're very high up there, but second place. Silver medal's pretty good on your wedding day, right, babe? (laughs) The theology of 1 John 4, 7 teaches something very clearly. The more I love Kimmy, the more I know God. There's no competition. The more I become a loving person, the more I know who God is. And so the more I love my spouse, the more I know who God is. But why stop with just Kimmy? There's other people to love, right? Someone I love very dearly is my mother. She's the best mom ever, and I'm going to brag about her. You know why? It's her birthday today. I absolutely love you, Mom. You're the best mom I could have ever asked for, and I just think that life is a gift, and you're the biggest reason for that. Thank you, Mom. I love you. People ask me how old she is. I was like, she looks like she's my sister. That's how old she is. (laughs) Not only do I love my mom, but I also love my kids, and we got to go trick-or-treating And this idea that I can't love my kids more than I love God is ridiculous. Can you imagine God being threatened by Pikachu here? (laughs) Like, that's just crazy. And yet, it's something I believed so wholeheartedly. But the fact is, the more I love my family, the more I love God, the more I know who God is. But my friends, why stop with just family? Did you know that I'm part of the most amazing church community known as Paradox? I, I genuinely love you people. 
Like, it is a gift to be with you every week. It is a gift to be with you in the times between. It is fun to go to coffee with you. I look forward to what is happening in your life and hearing about it. It is the best. I love getting to know you, and I love who you are. In addition, I work with some amazing people, both on the church staff and in the community of Redlands. I love doing ministry with all of these people. I love the friends I go on golf trips with. A few months ago, I went to my 20-year high school reunion, and I haven't seen some of these guys in 20 years, and I love them. I loved what it was like to hear about their stories and where they went, because there's a lot of people who went to places I never thought they'd go, and then they turned around and said, you're a pastor? I said, yes. (laughs) Yes, I am. But what 1 John 4, 7 teaches us is that the more I love people, the more I know God. But why stop with just people? Don't you love doing things on this planet? My favorite hobby by far is snow skiing. I love to ski, and I love the fact that I'm going in about a week's time to go and start snow ski, or a ski season once again. It's one of my favorite hobbies, and I'm always happiest when I'm on a mountain with friends and family, skiing as long as we possibly can. I also love to travel. This is one of my favorite travel pictures I've ever taken. It was in Chile. And one of my favorite activities locally is being able to play games with friends around a table. You will never find me happier than long nights playing the dumbest games possible. (laughs) And if we take 1 John 4, 7 seriously, what it's telling us is that the more I love just the experiences I encounter, the more I know God. But why stop with just my hobbies, right? Because all around us, there are these gifts that we have to highlight and celebrate because if we love these little moments that are unscripted, man, I believe that we know God more. This has stopped. It was a tradition and it stopped two years ago and my heart broke when it stopped. I think the owners of the house moved away. But on Cajon Street here, there was someone who set up a scarecrow every Halloween and it is the best scarecrow because they did some creative things with some pumpkins and this is what it looked like here. (laughs) It's a gift. (laughs) This is free. They didn't charge me to see this. This is amazing. I was dropping off my son at school, and uh, a Prius pulled up, and they parked right next to me, and I could not believe the license plate. It was the perfect license plate for a Prius. It said this, uh, OG Tesla. (laughs) Now, if you don't know what OG is, you can go to urbandictionary.com. OG is acronym for original gangster, meaning you have a classic style or stay in the older ways instead of newer. OG Tesla. (laughs) One other gift that happened not too long ago is this summer, my wife and I went to the Oregon coast. And everyone who goes to the Oregon coast has to go to the Tillamook cheese factory, right? Yeah, I'm not even sure I like Tillamook cheese, and I still went. So I got to see them ship all this saturated fat out into the world. It was incredible. But as we were walking in, I just started laughing because this bench is amazing. Look at this thing. At some point, some artist had to tell the people of Tillamook Cheese, hey, why don't you buy a bench for eight people that costs the same as a bench for 12 people? You can get a bench twice as expensive as it should be if you just shift the back from the front. And so Kimmy and I had all sorts of fun with this. trying to imagine, like, how would you sit on this and what did you do? And we just loved the bench. This was the highlight of the Tillamook Cheese Factory for me, was this bench. Why not just light up the pieces? No, we want to pay twice as much. My friends, the more I love the random things I encounter, the more I know God. But why just stop with the things that we love? I don't know about you, but laundry is a drag, right? Ugh. Laundry is so necessary. And the worst part about laundry is while you are doing laundry, you're creating dirty laundry with what you're already wearing. And so it's a never-ending cycle of having to do this chore week in and week out. And yet, it allows us to live with good hygiene, doesn't it? So while I've never asked anyone to love laundry, the question I can ask myself is, can I love my life? even if I have to do laundry? I think we can. It's tough, I know it's tough, but laundry is part of life, and yet life is still lovable. 
And if I can love that kind of life, which includes laundry, well, then at that point, I might even know God more. In all of my life, I've never met one person who says, I love paying taxes. Never happened, right? And yet we all do it. We have to pay taxes. We do like some of the benefits of taxes, like roads and stuff, but we don't like paying it. And yet we have to engage with it every year. My friends, a question to ask every year is, can I love my life even if I have to pay taxes? Because I think it's possible. And the more that we wrap our arms around the whole thing rather than just the convenient parts, whew, imagine how much more you would know God if you could love all of it and not just some of it. And when I think about what this life entails and what was just mentioned earlier during the lament, we all live with encounters of death, don't we? One of the hardest things that we do is go to funerals of loved ones, right? Right? It is painful, it is gut-wrenching, it is heartbreaking, and yet we are there for them because we wouldn't rather be anywhere else. Can I love this life even if I have to go to funerals? Now, what's interesting is religion told me that I could not growing up. They said death was never part of God's plan, that death is the furthest thing from God, and if we just believe enough, Jesus will come back soon and I won't have to experience death. And yet, I read the story of Jesus on the cross, and it's the story of God meeting us in death. Meeting us when sickness overcomes a life. And I'm like, I think to myself, maybe it's more important to learn how to love life in the face of death than it is to love a life that doesn't exist yet. And when we think about this, I mean, we all are thinking right now probably about our own mortality, thinking about how at some point this is all going to be our turn to go to the funeral, right? And even though you know it may not be permanent, right? A question I think all of us can ask ourselves when we're having questions of our own mortality is we can ask the question, can I love this life even if I have to die? Because I think that if you can learn how to do that, then you would know God. The more I love all of this, the more I know God. Amen. But why stop there? We're going to stop here because that's all. <laughs> it's everything. And when it comes to what it means to love God, I want to stand up here before you as a progressive Christian and tell you something. I just want all of you to know that I love God so much. Amen. I want you all to know it, and I'm not ashamed to say it. Get to take that line from the other side. <laughs> and I want you to know... If someone were to ask me, what does that mean? I would say, I just want all of you to know that I love all of this so much. We love God today by loving all of this. Amen. And if that sounds daunting to you, I would say, then you're starting to get it because this world does have suffering, doesn't it? And suffering is part of this life. And just when we think we figured out how to love this life with suffering, suffering somehow gets worse and challenges us to relearn it all, all over again. And I will tell you, it's a complicated thing learning how to love this life in all of its glory and all of its depths. But I have found that it's worth a lifetime to try and figure out how to love God. It is absolutely worthwhile to say, how can I wrap my arms around this whole thing? And then when suffering hits, I go back to loving something very small. I'm like, can I love the birds singing outside my window today? Because that's a baby step back to becoming a loving person. I think of the words of Peter Rollins, God is a mystery present in the very act of love itself. And whether you feel like you have a lot of length to give when it comes to your arms opening wide or you can just open them a little bit, what we've learned is that no matter how small or how big that love is, God is present right there as a mystery that is always just a step beyond our grasp. My friends, when it comes to loving God, I have a wish for all of you. May you all love all of this with your entire heart, your entire mind, and soul. And may you discover in that love the very presence of God. Amen. Amen.